Without pollinators, it's impossible for many of the fruits and vegetables we grow to produce a crop. Hi, I'm Ben, and today we're going to be looking at some top tips to attract bees, butterflies, and other essential pollinators into the garden. And I will be revealing the very best flowers to attract all these pollinators and make your garden totally irresistible to them. Before we get started, let's take a quick recap about what pollination is all about. Unlike us, plants can't walk about to find a mate, so they need the wind, or in most cases, insects, to help pollinate those flowers, to help them reproduce. The question is, are your plants getting enough of it? Sadly, many of our pollinators are in severe trouble with populations declining or even collapsing in some areas. There are many reasons for this, overdevelopment, agricultural changes, and also the overuse of pesticides in our gardens. The good news is that we at least can do something about that by making our own gardens a pollinator paradise. Modern breeding has often prioritised looks over substance. So you get these really large, blousy, double blooms that look fantastic, but they have hardly any pollen and nectar, which is what our pollinators are really after. Then you get some flowers that have got plenty of pollen and nectar, but the petals are so profuse that the insects can't get at it. What bees and butterflies and other pollinators are after are simple, single flowers with the pollen clearly displayed at the middle on the anthers so that they can get access nice and easily. No fanfare required, just simple access. So let's look at a few examples. This year I'm making a concerted effort to grow many more flowers in amongst my vegetables and boy is it paying off. I'm seeing so much more insect life. Most of the flowers are annuals that will self-seed, so they'll drop their seeds and then pop up here and there from season to season, year after year. I've got poached egg plants, which have a beautiful sunny side up charm. Then in front of me here are these gorgeous bullseye calendula. All around the garden, I've got nasturtiums. They attract pest butterflies that have caterpillars that eat brassica crops. So by hubbing them here, they'll draw them away from the crops I'm trying to grow. I also think they look gorgeous and the bees think so too. And as an added bonus, the flowers are edible. They've got a lovely peppery tang and they look great in salads too. Also throughout the vegetable garden are alisum. They've got a beautiful sweet honeyed scent and the hoverflies absolutely love alisum. Hoverflies will also go on to eat lots of aphids. So it's a win-win situation there. Then I've also got marigolds and zinnia too. Other fantastic self-seeding options include Californian poppies, borage, mm. and phacelia, which makes an excellent cover crop or green manure as well. Just lovely. Now, these are all flowers well suited to my growing conditions here and my climate. What works for you may well differ, so please do your research and work out what will grow best in your garden. I also let some of my herbs go to flower. Pretty much every herb has a really fantastic flower for pollinators. So parsley over here is great for things like hoverflies, as is this oregano. There's things like chives as well, rosemary, lavender, all fantastic for our pollinators. Also, consider letting some vegetables flower too. Onions and leeks and those other alliums, they're great for bees. And then you've got the wide umbels of carrots, which look just stunning in their own right. And just look at these celery flowers. There's an almost cloud of insects all over them of all different shapes and sizes. It's a real inspiration. Interestingly, research has shown that in towns and cities, the very best place for pollinators are allotments and productive gardens because they've got such a great variety of vegetables, fruits and flowers, which give a good range of blooms for those pollinators to enjoy. I really like to use the garden planner for selecting flowers that grow well with my vegetables. I've got the flower filter on here, and if I scroll through and select a plant, there are the instructions for growing it and the crops it will benefit. We should, of course, be trying to include more flowers throughout our garden, not just among our vegetables. And it matters that we include different types of flowers because they will attract different types of pollinators. So we've got tubular flowers like foxgloves, penstemons and honeysuckle and this gorgeous smelling jasmine here. They're great for insects with a longer tongue. And then you've got lovely flat umbel-like flowers such as those of parsley and carrots and things like yarrow. They're great for hoverflies. 
Apparently, purple flowers are great for bees, which find it easier to see colours in this spectrum. So examples might be nepeta or catmint, lavender and alliums of all sorts. And then you've got cardoon and globe artichoke flowers. And if you've ever seen those, you'll know how crazy bees go for them. Include a range of flowers that bloom at different times of the year because many pollinators will be on the wing as soon as the sun pokes through in late winter. Spring flowering bulbs are a winner for this. So too are rosemary, forget-me-nots, pulmonaria and primroses, and of course, spring flowering fruit trees. I'm also looking for flowers that will bloom later on in the season. In my region, that means stalwarts like a sedum and ivy. Now, of course, I'll repeat it again. What works in my climate and garden might not necessarily work in yours. So ask around, check local nurseries and select plants suited to where you're gardening. Pollinating insects tend to move from one flower to the next of the same plant. So by growing just one plant of a particular flower, you're making it a bit harder for themselves. Better to grow in a big group of the same flower so that once they finish with one flower or plant, they can easily move on to the next without having to search far and wide and expending too much energy. I like to grow flowers in great clusters or kind of rivers weaving in between other plants. Not only does this look better, it makes it so much easier for those pollinators. Plant in blocks of say three or five because that gives a much more visually attractive effect as well. If you have the time, it's worth removing the old flowers that are finished. Known as deadheading, this encourages the plant to produce more flowers, extending the display and the benefit to your pollinators. As a rule, native flowers or wild flowers will be much better for pollinators in your region. It makes sense because they will have evolved together. So how do we translate that to a garden setting? Well, it means allowing more weeds to grow and actually flower. Now I achieve that in my garden in two ways. First is in the lawn. I mow a lot less often so that the flowers that are naturally there do get a chance to flower. So early in the season, I'll be getting pops of yellow from things like dandelions, then there will be daisies, and then other flowers like a self-heal, clover, and tiny violets. What you get in your lawn may of course vary, but they will all be great for pollinators. My lawn gets mown on average once every three weeks to allow patches of flowers to complete their full life cycle. And then others, like this area I am sitting in, only get mown once or twice a year. That creates a really thick thatch for things to get in right in down there and then they can hibernate in there throughout the winter. The second thing I do is allow weeds to grow in some of the quieter corners of the garden. You'll find plenty of buttercups and brambles here, but my favourite weed is this nettle here. Nettles are the food plant of so many caterpillars. So the butterflies can come along, lay their eggs, and the caterpillars have everything they need. And then once they turn into butterflies, they'll be off to help pollinate the garden. Another great caterpillar food plant is milkweed, and that's the food plant of the monarch butterfly found in Central and North America. Yes, they will eat quite a lot of the plant, but in return, you'll get a beautiful kaleidoscope of butterflies. And yes, kaleidoscope is actually the collective noun for butterflies. How wonderful is that? Did you know that solitary bees, that's bees that don't live together in a big colony, are significantly better pollinators than the humble honeybee? There's some debate as to how much more effective, but up to four times is often quoted. Now you can help solitary bees by making them a bee hotel like this one here. Ideally, you want to locate your bee hotel up off the ground, say three foot or a metre high, well out of the way of predators. Somewhere it catches the morning sun is ideal because bees are cold-blooded creatures, so they will warm up quicker so they can get out and on with their shift at work. And if you can, shade it from the harshest afternoon sun so they don't overheat. The bees also need access to some moist mud, and that's because the females lay their eggs and then seal it inside the chamber here with a little core plug of mud. Bumblebees are also fantastic pollinators. These guys typically nest in the ground, and it's a real joy when you come across their nest and then buzzing in and out of it. Great homes for bumblebees include compost heaps, 
areas of longer grass and areas of piled up undisturbed leaves. We all know that bees, butterflies and hoverflies make excellent pollinators as well as, if you're lucky enough to have them in your area, hummingbirds. But other pollinators aren't quite as obvious. Ants crawling around, they actually spread pollen very effectively and then so do pollen beetles. Pollen beetles actually eat the pollen, but I'd let them be because they also help to spread it about through their movements too. And then there are wasps. And looking at some of these fallen apricots here from the tree above me, I can see that there's already been something pecking away at it and that, that will gain entry for wasps. Now wasps, yes, they do eat our fruits and they can be a bit of a nuisance, but did you know they're also excellent pollinators too, along with insects such as hornets? Now wasps, they do sting, but only 1% of wasp species actually sting. But obviously if you've been stung, that's no fun and won't be much comfort. And I can honestly sympathize with those of you who have been stung because it happened to me last summer while I was weeding and I got stung in the arm, but then I was wearing shorts and a wasp went in underneath and stung me on the nether regions. I've never been in so much pain. I ran into the house, tore my shorts off and was like, ah! But what I will say is that while I am wary of wasps, I do live alongside them because not only are they great pollinators, they also eat a lot of soft bodied pests such as aphids as well. Pollinators come in all shapes and sizes and with the distressing news of their decline, it's comforting we can at least do something about it in our own gardens. We need pollinators to help grow crops such as apples, strawberries, squash, and to boost yields of, say, peas, beans and tomatoes, and generally to keep our gardens thriving and healthy. Next time we'll be checking in on my container garden. It's a time of flux, so as well as doing some harvesting, we'll be making a few final sowings. You won't want to miss it, so please do make sure you're subscribed and have turned on notifications if you haven't already done so. In the meantime, keep busy in the garden and I will catch you next time.